Okay, so a 2 Samuel chapter 24, starting at verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, may the Lord your God multiply the troops and want to do such a thing. The king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders. So they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. After crossing the Jordan, they camped near Aroer, south of the town of the gorge. And they went through Gad and onto Jazer. They went to Gilead and the region of Tatum Hochai, and on to Dan Jan and around towards Sidon. Then they went towards the fortress of Tyre and all the towns of the Hivites and Canaanites. Finally, in the Negev of Judah. After they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. David was conscience-stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servants. I have done a very foolish thing. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad, the prophet, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land? Or... Three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, or three days of plague in your land. Now then, think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated. And 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord was grieved because of the calamity and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the fleshing floor of Aronah the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall upon me and my family. On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When Arona looked and saw the king and his men coming towards him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Arona said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so that I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague on the people may be stopped. Arona said to David, let my lord the king take whatever pleases him and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. O king, Arona gives all this to the king. Arona also said to him, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Arona, No, 
I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, for that reading. And uh, let me add my welcome to Nathan's. It's great to see you this morning. Uh, we're particularly thrilled that you're here. Uh, if this is uh, your first time with us, perhaps you're visiting uh, for the baptisms, and uh, we hope you've felt very, very welcome uh, indeed. It'd be helpful to have that passage open uh, in front of you. And uh, I'm going to pray again now and ask uh, for God's help as we turn to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have told us that if we give our attention to your word, if we tremble at it, then you will speak to us and we will know you in all your glory. And so we pray now as we turn to this part of your word that you will open our eyes, that you will show us Christ so that we might trust in him and be saved. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, one of the ways that you know that you have begun to understand the Christian gospel with that clarity that we've already thought about this morning is if you can answer this question, why can't God just forgive? Why can't God just forgive? way in order for God to relate to us? Why does the Bible insist on the awful reality of eternal judgment in hell? Why, when Jesus was in so much mental agony in the Garden of Gethsemane as he faced the prospect of the cross, that he sweated blood and prayed to his loving Father in heaven for any other way to save people, did he conclude that there was no other way. Why can't God just forgive? Sometimes the question is used as a weapon against biblical Christianity. In fact, nothing the Bible says has aroused more violent opposition than the idea that Jesus died as a substitute we deserve for our sins. Listen to this. Of all the elements of Christianity, writes Polly Toynbee in The Guardian, the most repugnant is the notion of the Christ who took our sins upon himself and sacrificed his body in agony to save our souls. Jesus' death, writes one prominent Anglican leader, was not an atonement for the world's sins. To believe that God would put Jesus through such suffering for our benefit is simplistic, naive, and crass. Or how about... American TV preacher Joel Osteen, who turns the same objection into an attempt to make the Christian message more attractive. God is not mad with you, he confidently preaches. He is madly in love with you. But the question is also raised, not in order to reject the gospel, but to grapple with it, to come to understand it. And it's worth feeling the weight of the problem. After all, if you think about it, the Bible commands each of us to forgive each other. When Peter asked Jesus in Matthew 18 how many times he should do that, Jesus replies, not seven times, but 77. In other words, an endless amount of forgiveness. If we can forgive each other as human beings, why can't God do the same? Why does God need an atoning sacrifice, as the New Testament calls the cross of Christ, to take away our sins? I mean, just imagine a parent whose child comes to say sorry for something they have done wrong. And the parent, instead of just forgiving them and moving on, 
demands that they make a sacrifice for atonement to win their forgiveness. No, Johnny, I cannot forgive you for taking your sister's last chocolate button until you have brought me a suitable sacrifice of atonement. Now take the hamster into the garden and slit its throat. Then my anger will be appeased. It is ridiculous when put like that, isn't it? If we can forgive freely, why not God? Why must judgment and hell and wrath be real? Why when the cross of Christ, why was the cross of Christ necessary? And why is it necessary for us to trust that cross if we are to be saved from the wrath of God? Why can't God just forgive? Well, we're going to find an answer to that question as we turn now to the final part of our long journey through the Old Testament books of 1 and 2 Samuel. It's an extraordinary chapter, isn't it, with which to conclude the story of David and his kingdom. It's full of puzzles and surprises. We're going to follow the narrative under the three headings you'll see on the sheet. We're going to see that the problem with David's kingdom all along has been the wrath of God. We're going to see, secondly, how God's commitment to his promise to David and his purpose for the world requires his mercy. And thirdly, we're going to see where that holy wrath and that great mercy meet. And then I think we'll see that the books of 1 and 2 Samuel that began with a childless woman, Hannah, and her heartfelt cry to God for his help could not have ended any other way. So let's begin then with wrath in verses 1 to 15. Look at verse 1 with me. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. The story begins with a bundle of complexities, and not all of them are going to be explained in the narrative that follows. For a start, we don't know when in David's reign this happened. If you've been here for the duration of this short series, you'll remember that chapters 21 and 24, or rather chapters 21 to 24, form the epilogue to the books of Samuel, and they sit outside the main narrative. They're not presented chronologically, they're presented thematically. And the sandwich structure, or the sort of concentric circle structure of these four chapters, make the point and draw our attention to the themes that, David wants, that God wants us to understand as we come to the end of the story. And so in that context of the epilogue, not chronological, but thematic, that word again in verse 1 must take us back to the counterpart of this chapter in chapter 21, where the epilogue began by showing us that a problem hanging over David's kingdom was the wrath of God. There, if you remember, at the beginning of the series, at the beginning of the epilogue, the whole kingdom's existence swung on the fact that God's wrath needed dealing with. And so this chapter mirrors that one, but with one important difference. In chapter 21... The wrath of God was directed against what was referred to as the blood guilt of Saul, Israel's first king. Now, in the final chapter, we see that the wrath of God remains a problem for Israel. But this time, David's own sin is caught up in the problem. Another conundrum in this chapter is that we are not given any explanation for the reason God's wrath is burning against Israel at this time. We're simply not told. We're just told that it is. We never find out why. And then there is the hugely difficult matter that in his anger, as part of his judgment against Israel, God incites David to do something that merits judgment, a judgment that David himself will get to choose. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, why after confessing his sin, and after God mercifully brings the punishment to end the sacrifice, a sacrifice is still required to appease God's wrath. Now that bundle of complexities should remind us of something. It should remind us that we are dealing here with God. We should not expect to come to the Bible understanding everything about God. Not only is he bigger than our minds can comprehend, 
He doesn't owe us an explanation at all. He is God. And we can't pin him down and come to terms with him. He won't fit into our man-made categories. He doesn't answer our every question. He keeps his own counsel. And so we should not be surprised. Sometimes if we read the Bible and our small brains cannot cope with the vastness of God. And so there will be unanswered questions. Having said all that, God is kind and gives us this generous clarity. And we will see this clarity before the end. Most of the threads will unravel. The fog will clear into a stunning picture, a fitting picture for the end of the story. Well, going back to verse 1, what we can say for sure is that for reasons known only to himself, God in his anger against the people causes David to sin against him so that God can inflict his punishment on the people of Israel. And in his sin, David creates a census, verse 2. You weren't expecting that, were you, unless you'd read the passage. So the king said to Joab and the army commanders with him, go throughout the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many there are. Now, immediately, we hit another puzzle in this passage. David has sinned before, which involved committing adultery and murder. Now God incites him to sin again, and it's a bureaucratic census. It's an act of statistics. Well, some of us might not be keen on statistics, but what is so sinful about them? What is so wrong with taking a census? After all, the rest of the Old Testament makes it clear that numbering people is not in itself sinful. The book of Numbers, the clue is in the name, begins by God commanding Moses to take a census. And at various times in 1 and 2 Samuel, people have been counted, especially fighting men, with no problem. There are, of course, many theories as to what was wrong with this census. And you can read these in the commentaries to your heart's content. Some, for example, say, well, counting people in most societies is an act of oppression. It's never a benevolent thing. It's never a neutral thing when governments gather statistics. There's always a kind of a a power motive behind uh, increasing the, the state's power, enlisting a professional argument, increasing taxation, even putting people into slavery. To count people is to own them. It's a form of control, of oppression. And there may be just a little bit of truth in that. Verse 9 makes it clear that the census is part of increasing David's army. And maybe this is one of the ways that the kings of the nation would take from the people something the kings of Israel were not to do. Well, all of that might be true, but our job when we come to the Bible is not to speculate on what we are not told, but to read the text in front of our eyes. Here's a bonus Bible study tip, if you like. It's not by any means the, 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 the main idea of the, of the talk, but here's a little bonus Bible study tip to take away into small groups and, and Bible study during the week that we always have this temptation to try and speculate on what we're not told. We've got to look at the text before our eyes. And a clue to the problem comes in verse 3, surprisingly, from the mouth of Joab, David's commander. But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king want to do such a thing? I say surprising because all the way through the story, Joab has been the voice of violence and pragmatism, often in conflict with David's high principles. Now, significantly, right at the end, those roles are reversed, and Joab, who we haven't heard about for a long time, suddenly becomes the the voice of godly principle. I say that because, actually, if you look at Joab's words, 
you'll see that he is kind of, he's twanging on the string of Hannah's song back in chapter one, uh, chapter two of 1 Samuel. Joab's reply to David actually reminds us of one of the great lessons of the book, a lesson that David should have learned by now, that a king must trust in God for strength, not in the size of his armies or the power of his weapons. Remember, the song that Nathan mentioned right at the beginning, the song of Hannah, which sets the trajectory of the whole book, it is not by strength that one prevails, she sang. But the Lord will give strength to his king. This is the lesson David believed when he killed Goliath with a stone, when he refused to kill Saul and allowed God to put him on the throne rather than taking it by force. This is the lesson we saw in those two inner circles of the epilogue in chapter 21 and 23 featuring David's mighty warriors. Remember Shammah son of Agi the Hararite defending his field of lentils against a band of marauding Philistines. Remember him the violent vegeta vegetarian? Great acts of courage but God was giving the victory and Joel of all people violent militaristic pragmatic Joel Joab sorry reminds David that bigger armies are not necessarily better. So Job's objection hints that the problem with the census is the motivation on David's part. David wants to be big and powerful, and he's forgotten that it's God who gives strength to his king. David is slipping into the kingship like the nations in contradiction of everything that he has learned. He is not acting like the king of his own prophetic song in chapter 23, who rules in righteousness, whose coming brings refreshment and blessing to the land. He has failed to trust God's promises. Nevertheless, David is king, not Joab. And so in verse 4, the commander does what he is told. And he and the army set out on a grand tour of the land, east, south, north, then west, then home to Jerusalem to David nine months later. Verse 9. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. Well, the statistics are huge, suggesting a nation of several million people. In the wider context of the Bible story, of course, this is good news. It's great news. Because in the beginning, God had created Adam and Eve and said, multiply and cover the earth. And in Genesis 12, he'd promised Abraham that his descendants will be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, almost uncountable. But now, for reasons that we are again not told, the sinful nature of the census, the sinful motivation in his heart suddenly strikes David. Verse 10. He is conscience-stricken after he counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, O Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Well, whatever the specific problem with the census was, verse 10 is one of two key statements of David in this story. We'll come to another one in a few moments. Because David now knows something about himself that we were told about the nation in verse 1. It is suddenly revealed to him with some kind of heart-stopping clarity that he is a sinner, that he faces the holy, just judgment of God. Remember, in the context of the epilogue, how crucial this is. Back in chapter 21, it was Saul's blood guilt that needed dealing with for the nation to prosper. Now king and people are one in their sin. The problem in David's kingdom is the wrath of God. And how big a problem that is, is about to be revealed. Verse 11. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to Gad the prophet David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. 
This is a surprise to readers of 1 and 2 Samuel because when God had previously confessed his sin, he'd received a gracious word from God's prophet, a word of forgiveness. But remember that David's sin in this case has been brought about by God in his sovereign will as part of his burning anger against his people. And so the judgment must fall, verse 13. So Gad went to David and said to him, Shall there come upon you three years of famine in your land? Or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you? Or three days of plague? Now then think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. The three choices are punishments that we are to assume are roughly equivalent because with increasing severity, there is a decreasing time period. But all of them are terrible. And David uniquely in the Bible, as far as I can think, is given the task of actually choosing the punishment. Now, why did God go about this in such an unusual way? Why not simply bring the punishment that he chose? Well, like so much in this passage, we're not told. But we can see the effect of this is to underline David's powerlessness to stop the punishment. He himself is a sinner. He is involved. He's one of the people. And so all he can do now is fall on God's mercy, which is what he does in verse 14. David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hands of men. At one level, this seems to exclude the middle option doesn't it it seems to say well option one or option three but not option two and in the midst of that there's a gold nugget of theological clarity formed in the furnace of David's anguish here that even though God's wrath is terrible it is not cruel and vindictive like the wrath of men it is just it's proportionate it is fair Let me not fall into the hands of men, but into the hands of the Lord. Nevertheless, because God is just, there must be judgment. Verse 15. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated, and 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. David has counted the people, and now we get another head count. A count of those who are wiped out in the wrath of God, whose lives come to an end. Notice that word plague takes us back to the Exodus, where God inflicted the enemies with the plague. And now God is inflicting his people. Now God is the enemy. Because where God's vast, unfathomable holiness meets with human sin, there will be wrath. There must be wrath. And so God's judgment falls on Israel. But now, secondly, we see that there is also mercy. Verse 16. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem... The Lord was grieved because of the calamity and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite. As David hoped, God's mercy is great. And now he sees how great it is. There are three things we need to see to understand the mercy of God here. Firstly, and very simply, God's mercy means he does not bring the judgment that people deserve in full. That word that our Bible version translates as grieved is probably better translated as relents. Because he's not talking about some emotional response on the part of God to his own judgment. It is talking about his will, his choice, his decision to show mercy. And the decision is presented very vividly in the passage, isn't it? The punishment is some kind of a disease, some kind of plague. The ultimate cause is God. 
But we now see that the agent of the punishment is revealed as the angel of God, reminding us again of the Exodus. And notice as the angel moves towards Jerusalem, it is at that point that God relents. And we need to understand the symbolism of that. It's Jerusalem that you may remember is the symbolic center of the kingdom. And therefore all the promises of God for the kingdom are caught up in Jerusalem. And so as the angel of death approaches Jerusalem, symbolically about to destroy the kingdom of God, God relents. In other words, God chooses not to destroy the promises he has made to David because of their sin. In other words, for God's kingdom to come, God must show mercy. And if there are to be any people in the kingdom, they will be people who receive God's mercy. That's the first thing. Secondly, notice the way the narrator has placed verse 16 and 17 in parallel. Verse 16 shows us the plague from God's perspective. Verse 17 gives us the same act of judgment from David's perspective. So verse 17, when David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I'm the one who has sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. But in verse 16, we've already read that God had relented. And so we are to put these two verses in parallel with each other. God stays the hand of the angel in verse 16. But in verse 17, God asks, David asks God to stay his hand. And he does. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, we see God's choice, his decision, his freedom to relent. But then we see David praying for the same thing. It tells us something important about prayer, doesn't it? About how God works. It shows us, doesn't it, that it's not that David is some kind of merciful man and he's begging a wrathful God to relent and, and God sort of listens and agrees. It's not like that, is it? God has already decided to show mercy. But he shows mercy in answer to David's prayer. How do we make sense of this? Well, God is so merciful, so sovereign, so big, that even though... And this is what the students are thinking about on Sunday night. How is it that if God is sovereign and all-powerful and he's already worked everything out ahead of time, well, what's the point of praying? Does prayer really make a difference? And if prayer does really make a difference, if what we do actually changes God's mind, well, doesn't that mean that God is quite weak? Well, here is the answer. Here is one good biblical answer to that question. That God is so sovereign, so merciful, so kind. He actually includes our prayers in his sovereign work. And that ought to encourage us to pray. But it also shows us, doesn't it, that actually part of the way God is going to save his people is by an intercessor. Somebody standing in the way, asking for mercy for men and women. And that brings us to the third thing we need to see here. And this is the second key statement of David in the passage in verse 17. He says, I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. This is a confession of personal sin. David believes that the plague has been sent upon the people as a result of his sin in carrying out the census. And so he looks at the people and he protests their innocence, seeing them as sheep. And he offers, notice, to step in their place, to absorb, to take God's wrath upon himself instead of them. It is, I think, an astonishing moment. David, the king, offering to step in and make himself a sacrifice of atonement 
for the people. It's no accident, I think, that David speaks here of the people as sheep. This is a final glance back to David's origins. Remember, if you can, back to 1 Samuel 16, where David was discovered looking after his father's sheep in a field outside Bethlehem. Remember what persuaded Saul to let him go and fight Goliath was his experience of defending the sheep against the bear and the lion. Well, now David, as king, is still a shepherd. And instead of the lion and the bear, he is facing the wrath of God. And therefore, as we come to the end of David's journey, I want to suggest that this is his finest moment. Here is the good shepherd who wants to lay down his life for the sheep. But it's an impossible dream. David cannot intercede for the people this way. He cannot act as a substitute for them. He might have been able to defend his father's sheep from the lion and the bear, but he cannot stand in the way of the wrath of God. He cannot do it for two reasons. Firstly, because they are not, as he suggests, innocent sheep. He asked God, what have they done? Well, God doesn't tell him, but we know God's wrath is burning against them. And secondly, because he himself deserves the wrath of God. And so if the wrath of God were to fall, it would consume him. He could not be that atoning sacrifice for sin. And so as we take a step back, we can see that two forces have been driving this story forward from verse 1. Both of them revealing to us something of the character of God. On the one hand, his awesome, settled wrath against sin. And on the other, his great mercy. His commitment to his own promise. And David cannot resolve the tension. And so what Israel needs is a place, thirdly, where wrath and mercy meet in 18 to 25. Notice that the request of David is left hanging in the air. God doesn't directly answer it. Instead, another surprise of the passage, we are suddenly in a building project. Verse 18, on that day, Gad went to David and said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. So David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When verse 16 described the act of mercy in the angel ceasing to bring death to the people, we were told there this little incidental detail that the place where the destruction stopped was the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. Now, what do you know about threshing floors? Let's brush up on our ancient Near Eastern farming practices, shall we? You've seen a combine harvester, the big green John Deere's scouring the land, if you go to any of the kind of uh, arable parts of the country around July and August. Well, they are the modern version of the ancient threshing floor. The combine is called a combine because it combines several tasks that used to be done separately. But actually, threshing is a process of separation. So a threshing floor was somewhere that was kind of raised up a little bit so it could catch the wind. And the purpose of the threshing floor is to separate the grain, the barley, the wheat, whatever it is, whatever cereal crop you've grown, to separate the precious grain from the useless husk. And so every farmer or every village or cooperative or whatever had a threshing floor where the grain would be piled and threshed, that is beaten, and lifted up into the air so the wind could then blow away the chaff and you have the grain. End time, he says... It's going to be like an enormous threshing. There is going to be a separation, a terrible final separation on the last day between the wheat and the chaff, 
And he uses this as a, as a striking and terrible illustration of where history is heading towards. And he says it's going to be the wheat and the chaff. And the wheat will enter the kingdom and the chaff will be left outside through this great act of judgment that God is going to do. And so this particular threshing floor, we're told, belongs to this guy, Arona the Jebusite. Rachel and I discussed how to pronounce that name, Aruna, Arauna. We settle on Arona. It's a nice name, isn't it? If you're looking for a boy's name, we've had lots in 2 Samuel. This might be the nicest one. And he's a Jebusite. That is, he's not an Israelite. He's not one of the people of God. He is a foreigner who's kind of left somehow in the city of Jerusalem, allowed to stay there after David took it over. Now, why are we going into all this detail? Well, notice the details become very significant. Not only for our chapter, but very significant for the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. Not only for the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, but actually for the whole Bible, for the history of the world, it turns out that the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite affects every one of us here this morning and our eternal destinies because it points to a necessary and final sacrifice. Firstly, because this threshing floor becomes the place of necessary sacrifice. See, when David offered to die instead of the people, he was kind of, he was tuning in to a real truth, a, a reality that this chapter has been building towards. That somebody must die instead of the people, if the people are to live. That is the reality of the wrath of God. God cannot just forgive. Justice must be done. And so David's offer to be the good shepherd who is willing to die for the sheep turns out to be real. It's true. But God doesn't answer him. Instead, he tells him to go and buy the threshing floor and build an altar. Because it turns out as we read on that the plague has not in fact stopped. We saw in verse 16 and 17 that the angel of God stopped the plague. But actually we see as we read on to the rest of the chapter, the, the plague doesn't stop until the end. The wrath of God is still hanging over the nation. God's anger has not been dealt with. The biggest problem that our world faces is the wrath of God. And so David does what the prophet says. He goes up to the place, just as God commanded, verse 19. He buys the threshing floor from a of the Jebusite. He buys the land fairly, making sure that everything is done properly. That even in the end, this is not a king who takes. Then, verse 25, the book ends. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. It's a very graphic lesson, isn't it? The plague stops because a sacrifice was made. A burnt offering, we're told in Leviticus 1, is an offering to atone for sin. A peace offering, we're told in Leviticus 3, is a celebration of the fresh start we have with God when sin is taken away. And so, the story from verse 1 onwards has been driving to this point, and it could not be clearer. Everybody in Israel deserved to die. Every person in Israel deserved to be one of those 70,000. But in his mercy, millions lived. God provided a way for his wrath to be received by another, by the sacrifice on the altar. And now the land is clean and the people can live. They can have forgiveness and a fresh start with God. Because as well as holy and awesome in his wrath, God is great in mercy. 
Except for you'll notice that the Bible doesn't end there. There's a lot more pages to come. And you don't have to turn over many pages to see how quickly the problem continues. How easily Israel arouses God's wrath again. How deeply they sin against him. How addicted they are to idolatry. How far they fall short of his glory. How often they deserve his judgment to fall. How urgently they need his forgiveness. Which brings us to the second reason that this threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite is so significant. Because it's not just the place of necessary sacrifice, it also points us to the place of final sacrifice. See, you may be wondering, why do we get so many details about this place? Why is the threshing floor mentioned so many times? Why does it take up more than a third of the chapter? This building project, which is just a a kind of a real estate deal. How is that the end of the book? Why does this epic book about the kingdom of God and the coming of God's Christ to the world come to such a conclusion as this? Well, you have to read on to find out. Because remember, the Bible is one story. It's not a collection of stories. And as you read on, you'll come to 2 Chronicles 3, which informs us that this site, the threshing floor of Arona, is also known as Mount Moriah. And there's only one other time that Mount Moriah is mentioned in the Bible, and that is a thousand years earlier, where Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God, and God intervened and provided a substitute. Not only that, but in 2 Chronicles 3, you'll hear that this threshing floor, this little place that David has purchased is the very spot on which the foundation of the temple was laid by David's son. And so the story continues. David builds the altar. And around the altar is going to be built the temple of Solomon, the place where God will dwell on earth, where day after day, year after year, Sacrifices for sins will be made. And that is how this great book ends. And so let us end our time this morning by returning to the question, why can't God just forgive? Hopefully we see now that a better question would be, how is it possible for God to forgive? Because once we get a glimpse of God in his awesome holiness and man in his deep sinfulness, that becomes the urgent question. Once we see that God, who rules his universe, is greater and vaster and deeper than our small minds can ever imagine, that he is different to us, he is beyond comprehension, He doesn't have to explain himself to us. He doesn't have to justify his own judgment. He is utterly different to us in his moral perfection. And once we've understood that, we come to understand ourselves. And we know, as David came to know, with that wonderful clarity that Yankee talked about in her baptism testimony, that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of the glory of God. That when God says we are to love him with our whole hearts, minds, and strength, we haven't done that. That when God says the wages of sin is death, we know that we deserve that. And then we come to understand that hell is real. The judgment is real. And the only hope for us is to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And this is why we have the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. This is why we study the Old Testament. Not for moral lessons, but to see Christ. To see Christ rooted in the kingdom of David. 
if we don't preach the Old Testament, study the Old Testament, understand God's revelation here, we end up with the gospel of Joel Austin. God is not mad with you. He's madly in love with you. We end up with a Christ without a cross. And a Christ like that we can do without. But in the son of David, Jesus Christ, who comes into the world and goes to the cross nearby the site of Aruna the Jebusite, near to the site of the temple, he becomes the place where wrath and mercy meet. And none of us can do without him. And there's one final thing we need to see. And that is that the lesson that the whole of 1 and 2 Samuel has been driving towards is this. If you think back all the way to the very beginning, the story begins with a young childless woman, Hannah. She was childless for reasons we are never told. We are just told the Lord had closed her womb. And like David in his sin, in her sadness and need, she cried out to God. Like David, she comes empty-handed to this place called Shiloh, which is a the kind of a precursor to the, the temple site in those days. Like David, she offers a sacrifice. And as she praises God in her prophetic song, she maps out a future for the entire kingdom of God. She looks ahead and she sees the way God will reverse every curse in this world. She looks forward to God's salvation coming through his king, his anointed, one who is humble but exalted by God. She looks ahead and sees dimly the picture we can now see most clearly. The son of David, the good shepherd, the one in whose body the sacrifice for sin is made once and for all, doing away with sin forever. The good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And once you've seen that, it's hard to imagine a better ending than this. But you know what that means? It means that we have a decision to make. A decision to make that the five people being baptized this morning have made and are going to illustrate in the baptism later on. To come empty-handed like Hannah, and throw yourself into the hands of God, whose awesome wrath and costly mercy meet in Jesus and his death. Will you do that now? Will you fall into the hands of God, whose mercy is great? Well, let me lead us in a prayer as we do that. Hebrews chapter 9 says this. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Heavenly Father, we are sorry for the ways we so easily trivialize sin, for the way we pretend that our greatest problem is not your wrath, and we thank you for the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, for pointing us week by week 
chapter by chapter, to this great son of David, where wrath and mercy meet, and we will live joyful, sacrificial lives ourselves,